Good morning, friends. I'm hoping to learn so much from our collective wisdom. I've never presented in a forum before, so I'm so excited to have this opportunity. Uh, the topic that, I've, that I'm working on is the Sabbath as Missiological Bridge, the case for the SDA Church in Southern Africa. The problem that uh, this presentation or this paper, the paper that I'm working on is addressing, is that in spite of such compelling um, holistic and eschatological understandings of the Sabbath, the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Southern Africa seems to have largely remained indifferent, if not altogether oblivious, to large Sabbath-keeping communities prevalent in their sphere of influence. These faith communities believe and practice Seventh-day Sabbath observance as an integral part of their worship experience, almost exclusively on the basis of a thus says the Lord, according to their reading of the Old Testament, though in many instances without elaborate theological expositions as may be heard by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The church seems to be missing a special missionary opportunity through gross underutilization of its unique vantage position with regards to the Sabbath message. Instead of reaching out to, the com to communities that already embrace the Sabbath message in ways that seek to explore the in institution more fully, there rather seems to be a uniform approach toward all non-Seventh-day Adventists. This paper seeks to bring awareness, the, the purpose, this paper seeks to bring awareness to the church in, the, in Southern Africa concerning the missionary potential that lies within reach um, of the seventh, of reach, okay, um, within reach of the church among people that are Sabbath keepers. In addition, the paper also seeks to proffer some approaches the church in Southern Africa could take to initiate ministry to the said faith communities. The questions that are in guiding this uh, uh, research is, what, are, what is the significance of the Sabbath to the Seventh-day Adventist uh, church? Who are the non-Adventist Sabbath keepers in Southern Africa? How did they come, how did those people, number three, come to know about the Sabbath? What is their understanding of the Sabbath? In what way should the SDA church relate uh, to the said faith communities? In attempting to respond to question number one, the, okay, I may not read some of the slides in, in the interest of time. The Sabbath is considered of great significance by the seventh day, in the Seventh-day Adventist understanding in relation to worship, in relation to, um, in, in fact, worshiping the true God, but also it's understood that the Sabbath will gain greater significance as we draw closer to the end of time, as it will become a testing point. According to Ellen White, the Sabbath will be the greatest test of loyalty, for it is the point of truth especially controverted when the final test shall be brought to bear upon man. Then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve him not. The keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the true creator. So the observ Sabbath observance is a test of loyalty to the worship of the true God. In this scenario, the Sabbath is understood as the ultimate test of loyalty, uh, okay, and so on. Question number, so the Sabbath is held as a very important institution in Seventh-day Adventist understanding. Um, question number two, who are the Sabbath keepers in Southern Africa? <clears throat> we find, first of all, the concept of Sabbath being inherent among the people of Zimbabwe not in the form of seventh-day Sabbath observance directly, but uh, indirectly of Sabbath observance in the form of uh, what is known as Chisi. Chisi is a day of rest which comes once every week, not necessarily on the seventh day, but it comes once every week, um, and it's usually on Wednesday in many communities within Zimbabwe. 
but in other communities it also, it also comes on Friday. So the, the anime, according to Zacchaeus Matema, the anime states the concept of Sabbath through Chisi. This is a day during which no work is allowed in a community, especially work in the fields. It is a mandatory day of rest. The day is understood to be sacred and is thus enforced by chiefs and other traditional leaders within any given community. It is believed that if work is done on that day, misfortunes such as lack of rain will befall the offending community. Offending in this point is thus considered a point uh, as posing a threat to the very existence of the whole community. Such offenses are punishable by penalties if repeated, a person is expelled from the given local locality um, or given area. The day, however, falls on different days of the week. Now, this goes back to, uh, the, pre, uh, to the great Zimbabwe days. There was, there is, up to this day, a very unique group of people in Zimbabwe called Balemba. They understand themselves as black Jews. Uh, Tests that have been done by geneticists have confirmed that they are Jewish. They have Jewish origins. <coughs> they are of Jewish origin, uh, independent uh, tests that have been done, DNA tests. Now, these people used to be the priests, the Levites of the ancient uh, Jewish, I mean, of the ancient Zimbabwean kingdom. They used to be the, uh, the, the priests. And their center or their shrine was called Njelele in an area called Matopos in Zimbabwe. And uh, according to Patisa Nyati, one of the historians in Zimbabwe, the, that center of worship was synonymous with the strict observance of the seventh day uh, Sabbath. Maybe this explains why W.H. Anderson, a pioneer Adventist missionary, would say that surprisingly, Sabbath, teaching Sabbath to uh, Zimbabwean uh, Africans was not a difficult thing at all for those pioneering missionary, uh, for the pioneer, uh, for the first missionaries. So we have this concept of Sabbath inherent within the uh, culture, and then B, we have got African independent churches. Uh, among these, we find the uh, church that was started by Joan Maranke. This. Okay, the African independent churches or African initiated churches constitute 36% of Zimbabwe population. This is a very interesting statistic considering that all the other Christians put together constitute only 24%. And the largest of these African independent churches is a Sabbath observing in, uh, church. In 1999, their membership was numbered at over 1 million in 1999, in Zimbabwe alone. But this is a church that has had influence as far as Uganda, as further afield as Ghana. They have members there. But mostly, they had greatest impact in Congo, particularly in Kasai province, um, in the 1950s, and so on. In 1932, okay, okay this is how the, 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 okay, he came to the observance of the, I mean, or the history of the person and everything like that. Okay, so this is a very big movement by Joan Marange and then a similar movement by Joan Masowe. Both of these men are from, they started their ministry in 1932. All of them are from the same province, which is Manikaland in Zimbabwe, the same province that I also do hail from. Uh, and as the names, okay, he started a church, Apostolic Sabbath Church of God. And the only different thing with John Masowe from John Marange was his emphasis on the independence of Africa from colonial rule. As a result, the members of this church don't work for any person, particularly white people. It's a no-no. They don't do that. They have their own skills and everything, and their goal is to teach Africans to worship God according to the Pentateuch and also to be independent. And so they have become very wealthy because of that spirit of independence. Up to this day, they don't work for anybody, not even the government. They don't even carry IDs. They, they are different, okay? <clears throat> or be, they were also influenced by Ethiopianism. And then we've got the apostolic uh, mission of Zimbabwe of Paul Maja. These, in, 19, in 2013, they were counted, I mean, estimated to be one million. This is in Zimbabwe alone. 
So we are talking of millions of Sabbath observers in Zimbabwe alone. A Seventh-day Adventists are almost one million now. But outside of the Seventh-day Adventist church, we have got all these. And then we go to South Africa. We have similar movements. And uh, we'll mention only two from South Africa. The first one being the uh, movement that was started by Shembe. Um, and Shembe, Isaiah Shembe, this is among the Zulus. He started a church which is called Ama Nazareta from the Nazarites, from the book of uh, Leviticus, the Nazarites. Uh, and these people believe in strict observance of the Sabbath, Pentateuchal laws, kosher, they don't eat pork and everything like that. Baptism is by immersion. And Shembe comes, uh, was born about 1869 and died in 1935. A very strong voice. His followers are estimated at 4 million among the Zulus. That's in South Africa. Uh, the Adventist church is nowhere near that kind of number within South Africa, perhaps even across Africa. And then, uh, other than Shembe, we also have the, we find also the <coughs> international, pen, he was also a prolific hymn writer, he wrote about 300 hymns, Shembe. And then, we also find the International Pentecostal Church within South Africa, the, uh, led by Frederick Modise, 1914 to 1998, that's his life. And um, he became a Sabbath observer after going through a very difficult time during the 1960s, 1962, getting sick, hospitalized in Johannesburg, and then being, uh, he claims to have been visited by God while he was in hospital. He was told the date when he was going to be released from hospital through divine intervention, and he was told that he was going to heal uh, 15 people before leaving that hospital. And historians confirm that that is how he got out of that hospital healed those people, uh, 15 people, got out, started preaching, taking people back to the Bible and to Sabbath observance. This church uh, is very strong among the Sutus, and they are estimated at about 3 million among the Sutus. So just these two movements, it's about 7 million already, uh, just these two movements, okay, within South Africa. And, but these movements are also represented throughout Southern Africa and beyond throughout Southern Africa and beyond, <clears throat> okay? So how did they come to know about the Sabbath? Direct revelations, as they claim, uh, through dreams, through visions and voices, they claim to have had voices, number two. Some of them learned from Seventh-day Adventists, like uh, the movement that is led by Paul Maja, he's 97 years old now, and he believes that he is a prophet to Africans. And his movement is big. In Zimbabwe alone, it's over one million. Paul, they learned about the Sabbath from Seventh-day Adventist literature evangelists. His son became a member even at one time of the General Conference Nominating Committee. Very powerful people. But now he has gone back to this church again. And they are very close to, they have a very strong affinity with Seventh-day Adventists. <clears throat> okay, and then there are vestiges of truth maybe uh, among the traditionalists, the animists. And then, um, re through reading the Bible. For Shembe, it was through reading the Bible. What is their understanding of the Sabbath? Well, the understanding is that it is God's holy day and it has to be kept. Many of them have not written, they don't write. So whatever is said about them, it comes from other people, not what they've written. They are not into theology as such, but they just practice. This is what God says, that's it. So they are not so much into theologizing. Uh, so we don't have a lot, they need to be studied. Uh, in order to understand exactly. Those who write, okay, I've already said that. So how can the SDHH relate to these faith communities? Maybe there are three options that I thought of. Number one, ignore them completely. Just imagine they're not there. Or number two, acknowledge, acknowledge their existence, but treat them like everybody else, missiologically. Just approach them like they don't know about the Sabbath. And you try to convince them about the Sabbath and which day it is, even though they already observe it. Or number three, Acknowledge them, but have a special targeted ministry for them. This is the option that I'm putting, I'm proffering as the best way to missiologically reach out using Sabbath as bridge. What would be the model or the basis, a biblical uh, missiological model? Using two examples. Number one, the example that we find with Jesus. Jesus had a targeted ministry. He made it clear that my ministry is to the lost house of the 
uh, sheep, uh, lost sheep of the house of Israel. And according to uh, the evidence that we have in scripture, Jesus was, it was his custom to be at church every Sabbath. The same is said about Paul. It's not, my argument here is that it's not only because it was now Sabbath to worship God, but that is where they would also meet with Jews. That was an added advantage for Paul, other than just worshiping God on the proper day. But Paul actually established many congregations by using this method of reaching out to Jews on Sabbath days. We find this uh, said throughout in the book of Acts. <clears throat> and then the Sabbath uh, in our history, when we go also into history, the history of the Adventist church, we find historical paradigms that should help as uh, reference points for the model or for what maybe uh, this paper seeks to proffer. Uh, that is the, our relationship in history with the Sabbath among Seventh-day Baptists. Uh, okay? As Adventists, we learned about the Sabbath through the Seventh-day Baptists. And our name, I think, was also influenced by the Seventh-day Baptists. The only thing we took out uh, is the, BAP, the BAP. That's what we re re replaced with ADV. Otherwise, the rest is the same. And then the exchange of members. Did you know that... Uh, there was a time during L, uh, James White's time, about 10 or so years, when Adventist ministers would be seconded into general conference sessions of the Seventh-day Baptists, and they would have voting powers and participating with the voice. And the Adventist church would also have Seventh-day Baptist uh, <clears throat> members in our general conference sessions, and they would also participate. It was because of this mutuality. The bond was, however, eventually broken because of the misguided zeal of some among Seventh-day Adventists who eventually disrupted those relations, and James White protested that. And you know that in Africa also, we had a link with the Seventh-day Baptists who eventually, when they were folding uh, their business in Africa, they gave over their mission station Malamulo in Malawi over to Seventh-day Adventists. Probably they had many options, but this element of Sabbath would they, perhaps is the one that they considered. And, they, and Malamulu up to now is a great mission station of the Adventist church. And um, okay, we, that's the same here. Even the way Seventh-day Adventism came to Africa officially, uh, in the first place, it was through the Sabbath connection. As a Dutch reformed member, Peter Vessels in South Africa in Kimberley, who had come to be convicted on the truthfulness of the, uh, the seventh of Saturday is the seventh day, the Sabbath day of the Lord. And he, at that time, he thought he was the only Sabbath observer in the world, only to be confounded when he ran into John Hunt, a recent convert to Seventh day Adventism uh, from California through the ministry of Bordeaux and uh, J.N. Loughborough. And he was shocked, I mean, that is Vessels, to hear that there's a whole movement in America who observe the Sabbath. That is how they wrote to the um, church in uh, Battle Creek in 1885-1886 and our first missionaries that were sent by the church to Africa were sent in 1887 uh, because of that. <clears throat> so it's the Sabbath connection and we also find uh, the last example and in the historical paradigms in Ka Kasai province in, uh, of Congo between 1972 and 1973 under uh, when uh, Mobutu Sese Seko was the prime minister, the government instituted laws that uh, regulated because I think they were getting alarmed by the proliferation of uh, African-initiated churches that were not being regulated by government or something like that. And they instituted regulations that these churches should meet certain criteria to be registered, like uh, $200,000 in the bank accounts and everything like that. Many churches could not meet this, especially African-initiated ones. So they were told either to fold up or to join those other churches. And because of this, <coughs> between 1972 and 1975, between 75,000 to 300,000 members of independent church, African initiated churches are requested to join the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And many of them were Sabbath keepers coming from... Um, Joan Masowes Church, the one we talked about, which started in Zimbabwe, and Joan Marange, uh, because they have also very strong representation in, in Congo, especially in Kasai province, and also the ones from uh, Simon Kimbangu's uh, church within Congo. And we are told that 
1985, 44,000 had effectively joined the church, and it was this Sabbath connection that uh, brought them. And so the proffered approach is Sabbath conferences. This is uh, what I call it. In other words, the Seventh Day Adventist Church in Southern Africa to reach out to these already Sabbath keeping uh, faith communities in ways that seek to enrich their Sabbath experience by like Sabbath and your family. Uh, these are just like topics. Sabbath and your health, Sabbath in history, which becomes an entry point into the great prophecies. Sabbath and soteriology, Sabbath and worship, Sabbath and stewardship. Because they don't have so much emphasis in this kind. They just say, it's Saturday, it's God's day, let's go and worship. But they, don't have, they, don't, they have not developed the theology so much. In conclusion, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a strong conviction of, growing significant, of the growing significance of Sabbath in matters of worship, especially in these last days. The church, however, seems totally oblivious to the existence of large faith communities of Sabbath keepers within their own territory. The failing... By failing to reach out to these uh, people, the church may be losing significant missionary opportunities. What are the recommendations? Pastoral training to, gi to give due weight to African studies in areas such as history and African traditional religions. Number two, there is need to be de uh, for detailed studies to be done on the Sabbath keeping uh, faith communities of Southern Africa in order to establish their theological understanding. And number three, armed with information from uh, point number two above, the church needs to intentionally reach out to these faith communities using the approaches of Jesus and Paul, using the Sabbath as a bridge. I thank you. Thank you, Pastor, very much for this uh, wonderful presentation. It's uh, one of the papers that I enjoyed uh, reading. <laughs> Let me see if you have any uh, questions. Or I wish somebody can keep our time as well. Yes, Pastor, where is that? Thank you. Thank you very much, Pastor, for uh, the research and the presentation. Very insightful indeed. Um, here in the Philippines, I have heard many times, I've not verified it myself, but I've heard that Iglesian e Christo is uh, the product of an Adventist. And it seems that they are outnumbering Adventists today. And in your paper, I could trace the same trend that those who have at least part of the message that we have end up outnumbering us. So my question is, did you find any reasons why is it that using the same uh, truth, let me put it that way, they are more successful at least in terms of numbers, especially in the area that you studied? Is there any reason or are there any reasons for that? Um, in my uh, study, honestly speaking, I've learned many of the things that I've shared with you while I was preparing for this forum. I come from the place where some of these churches are housed, but I never even bothered to find out what they're all about. I was actually shocked as I was preparing, uh, studying. I was actually surprised. In my study, I, the thing that researchers keep pointing to, for example, when you look at, uh, in fact, I think this is common throughout, uh, especially the African-initiated churches. What seems to be the common thread is that they are not uh, Eurocentric. They are Afrocentric. And they have a literal interpretation of the Bible. This used to be a point of contention between Johan Masowe. Masowe simply means wilderness, John of the wilderness. Johan is like shown away of saying John. Johan Masowe, John of the wilderness. Okay, he, this was his point of contention between him and, uh, okay, so John, John Masowe rejected 
the African traditional way of uh, like approaching God through ancestors and you know rejected witchcraft, adultery, all these things that are against the commandments on one hand. On the other, he also was not satisfied with the missionaries because although they read about miracles and things like that in the Bible, healings, they didn't practice it. So he rejects this, he rejects that, but he takes a position that this is what the Bible says and this is what we will do. And this has an amazing appeal, or it resonates with the African, okay? Which is, I think, what the Pentecostals are also doing right now. So they have a way of in, um, integrating what they understand of Christianity with what they understand to be the good values in the African culture. And Shembe is an amazing model of this. So that integ so they, they um, what is the right term in missiological terms? They contextualize. They really bring it into the, they don't, so they really bring it to the African, in the African way. And an African doesn't struggle to grasp it. So because of that, the movements really grow and they have interests of Africans at heart. They are pan-Africanists. They are not just preachers. They are also liberators. They are em economic emancipators. So they approach the African in totality, healing everything. So that is the, Thank what you. I found. Thank you very much. I hope you still have something else to follow up. OK. Any other? Uh, we have the doctor there. Please go ahead before we go to Dr. Safari. So my follow-up question is then, are we doing them service or disservice by trying to get them out of that which they are experiencing as good and bringing them into our own reality, which is Euro or Western, Westernized? Or are we the ones to become like them? That's my, what do you suggest? Okay. Okay. We'll, uh, can we have somebody, Moses, help us with the mic? Oh, is there? Oh, please go ahead, doctor. Oh. Yeah, the, he's, he's getting uh, all questions. He will answer once and for all. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Pastor Beriri, for that very, very inspiring and uh, scholarly paper that you have uh, presented to us this morning. I wish we had like five hours to digest that. That was uh, impressive work. Um, my first question is, my understanding of the Great Commission is for us to tell people about Jesus Christ, that is their, is their savior, and uh, they have to accept this and, as their personal savior. Uh, from what you have presented, these millions of people, I think, have achieved that. I was talking to our only pastor who comes from Georgia, uh, last week, and we we're talking about research that he's working on, and we came, came across the same kind of uh, uh, situation where Adventists, we always go after people who have heard the gospel. Millions of people who are already even give, uh, observing the Sabbath, you know, that's the, the, the main truth that people do not, uh, do not keep um, of the Ten Commandments. All the other commandments, I think most people can agree, but that one, there's a disagreement. Why should we spend time going to them when we have a 1040 window that <laughs> has people who never even heard of Jesus? Why should we spend our resources to go to them? Which links to what Pastor Ekoto is asking. Should, should we be about really bringing them to us? If we, we had recommended that, that we, go, we need to have a specific ministry for them, do we really have to do this? and bring them to us so that we can have inflated numbers and probably affect what they have got. You, you made a, something so nice there that they, they, they touch them spiritually, socioeconomically, a place where we have failed terribly as Adventists. Should we maybe add something but leave them where they are or even be more dramatic and, and join them? How do we deal with this, Pastor? Thank you for that. A any, any other questions before we give him the uh, yes, please? 
Thank you, Pastor, for your presentation. Um, I'm interested to know what's, the dif what's different with them when it comes to organization. But do they have a general conference? How do they conduct you know, their mission and things like that so that we can draw out lessons from them, maybe learn something from them in, in regard to how they keep, do they have schools maybe advantage, I mean, do they reach out mission, mission schools or seminaries, things like that, and what do they teach that is really different from what we teach in our schools? Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, Gabriel? Thank you so much for the presentation. It was so insightful. Uh, my concern is uh, this. I don't know if uh, our church knows something about uh, these uh, churches in Africa because our attention is too much in the Western world and sometimes we don't know even what is happening in Africa. Uh, I think we need to <coughs> let people know that there are some churches in Africa. They don't need actually to be uh, given our Seventh-day Adventist message uh, a Sabbath because they know already. So maybe we need to, to think of developing another strategy to reach these people because we cannot think that we, we go to them and then we bring Sabbath to them because they know it already. So maybe what we have to do is to develop a strategy to enrich their spiritual life and maybe through this we even come into cooperation with them and then something uh, they can learn something from us and then we can also learn something from them and uh, enrich other part of their spirituality and i suggest that such papers uh, should be maybe published in a place where um, other scholars will be able to read and evaluate so that all together we should be able to take some uh, real decision concerning the, 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 the strategies how to reach these people in Africa. Thank you very much. Maybe this is the last question because of our time. Is that okay? Thank you. What has the Sabbath to do with the message and mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is about Sabbath. So if we can define what is the message and mission of our church in relation to the Sabbath, then those who are Sabbath keepers, who got their own different concept of their message and mission, we will now understand why we exist. So that we don't have to, oh, these people are also Sabbath keepers, do we have to evangelize them? What is our message? What is the relationship of the message and mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in, in terms of, or in, the, uh, in relation to the Sabbath? Thank you very much. I think uh, these are the questions, Pastor Mbrini. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, also learning a lot, honestly speaking. Are we doing any service by trying to, re I think this is a question that is really cutting, running across um, when I listened. Are we, is it, I think in many respects, the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Southern Africa at least needs to, what, what can I say, to reconfigure so that it can be accessible to the African. The conception that many people have, for example, when just people talk in the street, is that uh, they like Adventist music, including Robert Mugabe. That's his favorite. That, in fact, that's the only thing he calls music. Okay? Um, and, but then, to the many other people, the Adventist church looks too sophisticated. It, it, it looks very sophisticated. We don't see it, maybe. But it looks very, I don't know in what ways, it, but it looks very sophisticated and inaccessible. Uh, so the Adventist church to begin with, I think would need to reconfigure if that were possible, 
to be more accessible to Africa, to the African person, maybe in terms of music. For, I think, I, I'm thinking of situations where like some pastors will tell you that in this church, we don't sing African hymns or African choruses. The hymn book is full of songs. Have you finished those songs? Oh, when you sing the hymns, no, 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 that's not in the notes. But you are not notes people. Notes just a bubble from our blood, and that's it. They are written in the veins. We don't write notes in books. They are in the veins. You know. So I think there's a some there's a challenge there. There's a challenge. <clears throat> and then, uh, are we doing them any favor? This what the model that I'm proffering here is to enrich their experience. Uh, Apollos, although he was very educated, needed some people to tell him additional things he didn't know to enrich their experience. They may become Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists, or they may not. They already have the message, Jesus, disciples, we saw someone preaching in your name, we tried to, we stopped him, said, no, no, don't stop him. That's what Jesus said. James White said the same thing about Seventh-day Baptists. He said, please don't bother those people. Don't bother them. If some of them decide to be Adventists, it's okay. But if they stay there, they're okay. That's what James White actually wrote. And so, but we would reach out to them in a way that enriches their experience. And perhaps, who knows, this could actually broaden uh, the workers and finish this work faster. Because going at the pace we are going, I don't see how it will be done easily. And maybe the case in Kasai could be a microcosm of a future macrocosm. When, you know, compulsion comes, who knows that all these structures will collapse into one thing that only God recognizes and that will finish the work. So I think we should not ignore them. And then organize, their organization is very simple. They don't have sophisticated structures of conferences and unions. It's very simple. And the, many of them actually don't have, they don't even build uh, structures for worship. Maybe, I think it's still the same in Kasai. Uh, okay, among the... Uh, and so they don't build because they believe we are pilgrims and wanderers and so they just worship in open air throughout southern Africa and many other places where they've been to. <clears throat> Most of them don't have schools. Some of them, like Paul Maja, they send their children to Adventist schools because they have confidence in Adventists. They buy Adventist books. You know, when a literature evangelist goes and you convince the prophet, you don't need to talk to all the people. The prophet will just tell them, I was shown in a vision, you need to have this book. They buy those books more than all the Adventists put together. I'm not talking about imaginary things. This is reality. This is reality. Adventist books, they buy Adventist books. They read Ellen White, some of them, more than any of us has ever done. They, it's amazing. And I was challenged by one of their prophets, actually. <laughs> he has read more Ellen White than I have. And then, uh, so, the approach, unfortunately, as I finish, is that as a church in, in uh, Southern Africa, we still maintain the approach of apologetics and uh, you know, that kind of approach of saying Sabbath, which is the Sabbath day and what, and, and that's the approach, one size fits all. But I think it's failing in this regard. And um, the message and mission, Revelation 14, calling people to worship the creator, which is encapsulated, of course, in the Sabbath. Uh, but of course, so this does not militate with reaching out to them. It depends their experience, and who knows, it may hasten uh, the coming of the Lord. But the approach that we have is that, uh, well, what can come out of these Africans? The, the truth has to be from across an ocean. But I think that's a, an approach that doesn't work. Um, I became convicted that I think God has been at work among Africans here. And these people want Africans to be proud, not to be second citizens to anybody. This is their approach, a trust which uh, perhaps we are yet to have. I thank you. Can I comment on something? I think uh, I had the privilege of working at Seleucy, uh, maybe directly to Gabriel's question, and many of them come to Seleucy to study there. And uh, their understanding of the Sabbath, as far as Zimbabwe is concerned, of course, totally different from our understanding of the Sabbath. Uh, they don't look at the Sabbath as a day that has eschatological significance and the beast and the mark of the beast. This does not exist to a certain limit uh, to, to their understanding of the theology of the Sabbath. So an institution like Seleucy and our high schools throughout Zimbabwe, they bring that, uh, that lacking significance of the Sabbath to their understanding. 
uh, of, of what the Sabbath is. They implement what uh, Exodus 20 says, thou shalt not work and do all these things. But it's still, even though if somebody is keeping the Sabbath, the Seventh-day Adventist theology and doctrines is totally different from other denominations understanding. I think we have to be, uh, uh, sorry? Yes, yes, and many of them get, get baptized because they do not know that the Sabbath has uh, different segments. We have, we, even if we have gotten the Sabbath from Methodists, even if we believe salvation, uh, faith and grace like other churches, is still the Seventh-day Adventist understanding of the doctrines itself is diff totally different from other denominations. We still have to reach out, even if someone keeps the sa'ah, it's okay, it's okay, we do not need to reach him, no. Uh, so I think, uh, but we thank the Lord that the work is growing in that particular region. Pastor Embriri, we thank you very much for uh, this uh, insightful paper and the scholarly work and the time you have uh, put into it. Also thank you the congregation uh, for uh, these insightful ideas hopefully to improve the paper further. Let's give him a, a big hand for this wonderful presentation. Thank you very much.